I previously made a very brief, few-second-long video called The Forgiveness Filter, and it just was a quick little video which showed uh, a piece of red filter being dragged over a bunch of text, and then you could see more clearly one portion of the text than the other. And so now I'm going to expand on what that idea was, because it's important and it's something that many people have problems with being able to understand or to interpret the Bible in a way that makes sense and even more importantly that provides any kind of sense of security and any kind of sense of comfort. And so this is the forgiveness filter explained as a Bible interpretation method. So people have very much difficulty, regardless of translations even, um, being able to separate out how to interpret passages. And in fact, even from scholars, you go to five different commentaries and get five different opinions on what a passage means. Additionally, many people are subjected to a combination of the traditions of men and the effect of having the C.I. Schofield Bible in the pews in their church. So what happens is they don't understand the Bible, and then there they have this description that tells them, allegedly, according to C.I. Schofield at least, what that passage means. And so that gets accepted, and when that matches up with what the preacher is saying, well, that must be the truth. That must be what it says, because the problem is that the people reading it don't actually know what it says. They trust the preacher having studied it out, and they trust what this book, having a commentary in it, has to say about it, but have no real ability to determine what it really means, and then... You know, it just gets reinforced over time by not having a better tool and a better technique to determine what to make of a passage. How literal is it? Uh, what does it mean? Is this an argument being set up to be countered? Is this the counter argument or is this this the premise being stated that's about to be undermined by the counter argument? I mean, there are many different things involved in a passage where simply reading it without further detail and further technique can really leave you wondering whether it's a contradiction or, how, you know, how does it make sense, what to do with it. And so the forgiveness filter is my principle that I use, and that principle is that Jesus was enthroned on a cross, crowned by our, th our sin, and that upon that cross, while being violently, brutally, and unjustly murdered, after having been brutally tortured, he proclaimed forgiveness to the praise and honor of the Father. And my principle is that all things, including Bible interpretation, needs to bow down and plant its face in the dirt to that proclamation. So nothing can supersede Jesus enthroned on that cross and proclaiming to the praise of the Father, forgiveness. Anything that refuses to bend its knee to that is therefore anti-Christ. Anything that refuses to bend its knee to that is against Jesus. Anything that refuses to bend its knee to that is against God. So the thing is that that is the tool that you need to use in interpreting a Bible verse which could include simply setting it aside, not knowing what it means for right now. And that's okay. This is a, a Gnosticism that has invaded really culture in general, but I think it stems from the Gnosticism within mainstream Christianity. That It's wrong somehow to simply not have an answer to a question for a period of time and that everything must have its explanation. And people would ref even prefer the, the comfort, I guess it is, of having a wrong answer, say perhaps C.I. Schofield's commentary on the issue, than having no answer at all. 
But the answer is that Jesus proclaimed forgiveness. And everything needs to bow down to that. So, we go to John 10 and verse 30, and Jesus says that I and my Father are one. And in John 14 and verse 9, and Philip says, let's back up a little bit. Philip says to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, yet you have not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So he says that he and the Father are one, and that to see him is to see the Father. He didn't seem to indicate that to see him was to see the good cop side of the Father, or to see him was to see one facet of the Father, or to see him was to see the nice guy side of the Father. But to see him was to see the Father. That there is no difference, that there is no separation, there is no lack the in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And this is what he's saying. So any characterization of anything that you're getting that characterizes God in some fashion that seems to be different than what Jesus presented is wrong. And furthermore, his final act upon that cross was to state, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So that is something that he did on behalf of the Father. That is not something he did in rebellion to the Father. That is not something he did contrary to the Father. That is not something that he did, you know, that the Father found tolerable for a period of time. Sure, I'll indulge you for a moment, but then I'm going to go back to being who I really am. So the real conflict here is, do you agree that Jesus spoke on behalf of the Father when he when he asked Father, forgive them. Was that merely a request? Did the Was that just a, a, a plea, a beg? Was he saying, please, please don't hurt him, Daddy? You know, and the Father said, well, I'll consider it. You know, and he's been mulling it over for 2,000 years as to whether he really wants to forgive or not. Um, you know, is God a, a forgiveness vending machine? That if you pay the right price and push the right buttons, then he offers forgiveness. Or, as the name Jesus means, God is salvation. Is God salvation? Is there nothing separating the concept of God from salvation? So, there's either a conflict here between Jesus wanting forgiveness for those who are unjustly and brutally murdering him, or there's some kind of incoherent senselessness where that's not the worst thing you could do to somebody is to unjustly murder them. You know, in fact, one of the interpretations I've heard that that I've considered is that Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, was actually reaching out to know that it wasn't something he was really feeling at the time. Possibly, I don't know, is worthy of consideration, that maybe he was calling on help. He was calling on the Father to help him wants to forgive what was those for what was happening to him. And so maybe in a sense what he was saying was, Father, help me to forgive them. As a man, as the Son of Man, help me to forgive them. Because I understand that they don't know what they're doing. But right at this moment, I'm hurting so bad that I'm not entirely sure how capable of it I am. It's just something for consideration. So... Perhaps that's why it's phrased as Father, forgive them, rather than saying, I proclaim forgiveness in the name of the Father. You know, maybe this was something where he's actually reaching out in a prayer to say, you know, I'm at the end of my ability to do this on my own, because of myself I can do nothing. So getting on to the premise of the forgiveness filter is we go to Jeremiah chapter 33, and we'll start at verse 6 and read down through verse 9, because this is going to show that God considers it a praise and an honor to offer forgiveness. So to withhold forgiveness would be to withhold joy, praise, and honor from himself. So in Jeremiah 33, 6, 
It says, Behold, I will bring it health and cure. I will cure them and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. And I will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness, for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. So here it says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity and pardon all their iniquities. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor. For God to withhold forgiveness, therefore, is to withhold from his own self joy, praise, and honor. That makes no sense. Therefore, we can see that when Jesus is proclaiming forgiveness on the cross, he is doing so in the will of the Father here. So that's the point here in Jeremiah, is that we can see this as being the will of the Father, that it is to his praise and honor to offer forgiveness. And to withhold forgiveness is therefore to withhold praise and honor. So, let me see, I need to switch some things here. What we saw here in the previous video was, I used the idea that I remembered from, you know, cereal boxes, there would be a treasure map and there'd be a piece of red film. And when you'd place the red film over it, all the, the noise of the drawing clarified and you could see the little treasure map on it. So I've made my own version here with concepts that come from the Bible. God is angry, day of judgment, his mercy endures forever, cast out, fear not, fire of hell, God is love, vengeance is mine, nothing can separate us from the love of God, cast into fire, smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, outer darkness, wailing and gnashing of teeth, I will never leave you nor forsake you, depart from me, I never knew you. So it seems like a rather confusing message, there's some noise, there's what clearly seems at least to be contradiction. Um depending on the preacher you're listening to and the commentary you're reading. So there are many methods of attempting to resolve these, such as dispensationalism saying, you know, well, this is one covenant versus another. I don't find that satisfactory. To me, that says that God has changed and apparently actually ran things in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense and doesn't seem very loving and Seems like he's really just not that intelligent to do things that way in the first place, to be honest. Um, so I don't find the dispensational view satisfactory by any means at all. What I find to be more satisfying is an idea that perhaps the point of what's being told is being missed, and that if we have a tool to know what the point is, such as, okay, you know, I'm not like these other things, images of God that you've had, and here's one point that's being broken down. You know, so, for example, if we take the uh, passage in Isaiah where he says, I, I make evil, or, you know, I, I make good and evil. I forget exactly the passage. I didn't look it up ahead of time. It came to me just now. But the point is not really so much that God causes evil, which is how it ends up getting used, but rather that there isn't another God who is the God responsible for evil. It's a denial of a competition against other gods is really the point. So we can find out that there's just a point being made in the narrative and that maybe we're missing the point unless we've got a tool like this forgiveness filter. And so the forgiveness filter says that everything has to bow down and plant its face into the dirt to Jesus proclaiming forgiveness from the cross, and that includes what you get out of Bible verses. So this noise, when we move the filter, seems to go away and be replaced by an increased clarity. So not only is the noise less visible, it's less obvious, it, it kind of dissipates, but those other parts become clearer and more obvious. So what we see is his mercy endures forever. Fear not, God is love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I will never leave nor forsake you. This is the result of applying the forgiveness filter, is that the noise dissipates 
and the real and the true message becomes more clear. So we don't have to say, you know, oh, you know, you're denying scripture. No, I'm not denying scripture. I'm bowing down to the proclamation of Jesus from his throne because he proclaimed forgiveness and everything needs to bow down to that. So I'm not denying scripture. I'm interpreting it correctly through the lens of forgiveness because that is what he proclaimed and that is what everything bows down to. You know, so the question is, do you want to have your understanding of the text bow down to Jesus? Or do you want Jesus to come down off of that cross and plant his face in the dirt and bow down to some man's interpretation of what the text is supposedly saying? I don't find that satisfactory in the least. I don't think that we should be telling Jesus, get down off of that cross because you don't look like the God that my Bible interpretation is telling me that you should look like. I think that my Bible interpretation needs to bow down and plant its face in the dirt and say, I will bend to your will. So, you know, these scary things disappear when you realize that that he was on that cross being completely unjustly murdered. And his final thoughts were on proclaiming forgiveness. So, another thing to consider is the fruit of the Spirit is a tool. And I'm not on the right page here. The fruit of the Spirit is a tool to help discern where things are coming from. So, we see that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, this gets used as fruit inspection where, you know, am I, I'm not seeing the, I'm not seeing the self-control. You're not exhibit, you know, you're drunk. You're a drinker. You're not exhibiting self-control. You must not have the spirit. That's not what this is even attempting to tell you. What this is attempting to tell you is that the, the things that you'll get out of a message, the things that you'll get out of a person, the things that you'll get out of, out of what you're hearing from God, is going to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's what you receive from the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit produces fruit. The fruit is these, is these characteristics. That's what this is saying. It's not a way of looking at somebody and trying to determine if they're, quote, saved, end quote, whatever that means because it means different things depending upon your denomination. So I put in contrast to that the fruit of the law, because this is really what we want to compare it to. And this is my interpretation, you know, trying to go tit for tat is a little bit difficult. But the fruit of the law is fear, despair, insecurity, bitterness, condemnation, spite, suspicion, strife, and and a rebelliousness. So going through this, fear is the opposite of love, not hatred. Fear is the opposite of love. That's why the Bible tells us there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. He who fears is not made perfect in love, because they are the opposite of each other. I put joy and despair as opposing each other, peace and insecurity, long-suffering and bitterness, because long-suffering is basically being capable of enduring a situation and allowing it to continue. Whereas bitterness is the resentment that you build up when you're, you know, when when a situation that's not pleasant continues, it tends to, to yield bitterness. Unless you've got this spirit indwelling that has caused you to be able to endure it with long suffering, rather. Gentleness versus condemnation, because it seems to me that being gentle towards someone is the opposite of condemning them for what they've done. Um, Goodness versus spite, faith versus suspicion. You know, I think we kind of see faith as like, you know, belief in Jesus. But, you know, I kind of looked at this as though faith in a person, you know, I have faith in you. I trust you versus suspicion, you know. So when you're suspicious of somebody, you don't have faith in them. You, You know, they say, you know, let me borrow five bucks. I'll pay you back. And you think, yeah, right. I'm never going to see that five bucks again. 
you know, so I kind of felt like faith and suspicion opposed each other. Meekness, which is actually when you're capable of, well, I, I've heard it characterized uh, as the ability to keep your sword in its sheath. So what it means is you have a sword and you know how to use it, but you're just not going to. It's a form of self-control. And so strife would be to pull it out, you know, pull that sword out and actually engage in the fighting. Um, temperance is self-control. And to me, the opposite of that would be a sense of wanting to rebel against what you've been told. You know, don't do this. And you, you want to say, yeah, I'll show you. Um, to me, impulsiveness is not so much the opposite of, of, of temperance as rebelliousness is. Because it seems like something where you are lacking the control, not because you simply don't have the ability to stop yourself, but because you actively in you're, you're actively presenting yourself in rebelliousness to it. So it's more conscious, it's more decisive um, than simply having a lack of impulse control. So we see that the law produces these these conditions in people while the spirit produces these other conditions in people and so if the message you're getting is making you feel fear or despair or insecurity or bitterness or condemnation or spite or suspicion or strife or desire for rebelliousness then it's law it's not grace it's not the spirit if it's causing you to feel joy love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, then that is the fruit of the Spirit. Then what you are hearing is from God. So you don't need to go to the Bible and find out whether it's okay to invade a city and burn and kill everybody that's within it, because that's in the Bible. Basically, everything is in the Bible. If it's ever happened to anybody, it's in the Bible. Um, so it's really a poor technique to use as an authority um, to just say, well, is it in the Bible? Well, yeah, a lot of things are in there, but what is it doing to you? What is it, what is it telling you? How's it making you feel? What is it saying about how you should treat other people? Um, and so this measurement here with the fruit of the spirit versus the fruit of law is a good way to tell you if you're getting the right message out of something or not, because the right message out of it is going to make you feel at peace. The right message out of it is going to cause you to feel kindness and gentleness towards others. The right message to you is going to cause you to have faith and trust in others and to trust in your own safety and security and to trust in yourself. Um, but if it's the wrong message, it's going to produce fear. It's going to make you feel insecure. It's going to cause you to feel bitter. It's going to cause you to condemn yourself and others. It's going to cause you to be suspicious and to engage in strivings with others and fighting with them and arguing and debating and, and all other kinds of silly things that aren't worth anybody's time and aren't helping anybody. So ultimately, these are tools to use in interpreting what the text says. So now you don't need to go and wonder, uh, you know, what do I make of this verse that says the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever? Well, whatever it means, it has to bow down to Jesus proclaiming forgiveness.